Hello and welcome, welcome friends, to another edition of Conversations with the Horn of Africa TV. Today, I am very honored and I feel pleased to have as my guest the president of the Somali region of Ethiopia, Mr. Mustafa Mohammed Umar. Uh, welcome uh, to you, President Mustafa. Thank you, Elias. Thank you. Uh, that's very happy that uh, you could join us from your busy schedule. By way of introduction to our viewers, uh, President Mustafa uh, has been a long-time uh, political activist. Uh, his background in education is in uh, economics, graduated from the University of Addis Ababa in 1995. He then worked in the Somali region in various capacities in uh, uh, humanitarian relief work, uh, in education, uh, traveled to all the districts and the Kabele of the vast region. Then he also went and continued his education to get his Master's of Science from uh, the Imperial College of London. Uh, Masters of Science in Agricultural Economics. And after that, he worked in the United Nations Office of uh, for Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs, OSHA for brief, in various countries, uh, Zimbabwe for three years, Kenya, Somalia, the United Arab Emirates. And currently, after the reform was ushered in, in Ethiopia, he came to lead the Somali region as president uh, uh, slightly over two years ago. I hope uh, <laughs> that gives our viewers enough introduction. If you feel like adding uh, something more to your background, please go ahead. No, uh, thank you, Elias. I think that is uh, uh, perfect for now. Very well. Uh, so I would like to ask you first, uh, you came uh, to assume uh, leadership in the Somali region at a very troubled time for your people and that region, which had been devastated by years of uh, conflict, massive humanitarian affair, uh, human, human rights uh, violations. So uh, how did you meet those challenges when you came to office in September 2018, I think? Can you please talk about uh, what has been happening in the Somali region in the past two years? <clears throat> Again, thank you. I'm also very pleased to be uh, your guest. Um, as you rightly said, I was uh, in this position uh, for almost um, slightly over a year, uh, over, over two years. Um, and uh, as you said, the region uh, was in a very difficult situation. Um, we uh, came at a time that human rights violations were widespread uh, in, in, in the Somali region, but also in the rest of the country. Um, at a time, uh, uh, institutions were destroyed um, at a time uh, that uh, no meaningful development activities were underway and uh, also uh, very seri uh, serious intercommunal and inter-ethnic uh, tensions uh, were existing in the Somali region. We are glad in, to say that after two uh, years, uh, the region is now peaceful. Um, human rights violations um, are not there. Uh, there are commendable development activities that have started, particularly on education, roads, health, um, water, and uh, job creation, and that uh, people now feel free to say what they want uh, without fear of uh, detention or uh, harassment of uh, family members. So a lot has changed in the last two years. Well, we have also started uh, uh, some uh, institutional uh, reform activities. Uh, and we can now say that uh, we are making a lot of progress on that front as well. Um, we have also done very good security reform. And now the Liu police, the special police, 
uh, that uh, was even famous for uh, very grave human rights violations in Somali region and have now turned into a very disciplined and reliable uh, force which respects uh, the rule of law, which respects human rights, and uh, which uh, uh, is serving the public. So a lot has, has changed. We are happy. Uh, we have also managed to ease uh, tensions with our neighbors. Uh, at the time, uh, the change of leadership came to Somali region. A very bad border conflict existed between Somalis and Oromos. That's no longer there. Uh, we had uh, very serious communal tensions in Dijiga and the major towns after the August 4 uh, attack on non-Somalis. That too has uh, been healed to a successful degree, I would say. And most Ethiopians now take the Somali region as an area where they can, where they feel comfortable and safe to work uh, and to live. So these are the kind of changes that uh, the change brought to our region. Yeah, th this is uh, very surprising to many viewers from outside because your region, the Somali region, has been the most devastated by the ancient regime, the TPLF uh, regime and its proxies in the Abdile uh, administration. Uh, but given that background of uh, severe uh, violations, atrocities, how was such healing uh, been able to... <laughs> to come about in such a short time, that is surprising. Uh, of course, a lot of it has to be due to the resilience of the people and the sense of wanting to move forward. But uh, what other measures did you take, you, your administration, undertake to make that happen? Uh, that kind of healing, this, this the kind of social harmony and peace and stability that we witness in the Somali region right now. How, how, how did you... <laughs> Uh, what was your secret is what I'm trying to find out. Yeah, I think the biggest secret is what you already said, which is uh, that people were ready for peace. And after uh, living through very difficult times and decades of uh, violence, um, our people were finally uh, ready to embrace peace. Um, the fact that uh, we also quickly engaged the uh, rebels in the Somali region, I think was a major turning point. And in that, I think the leadership of the federal government also played a very key role because uh, they opened the political space for the for armed groups that uh, chose that, that road because they could not um, air their grievances peacefully during the TPLF era. So I think the fact that the people were ready, that we engaged the rebels uh, on time, uh, that we quickly uh, made a very comprehensive risk analysis of where the next fault lines can be, and uh, implementing some policies and strategies that really helped us diffuse the tensions between the communities were uh, instrumental all in, in, in changing the security situation of the Somali region. Um, the other main reason was the fact that we implemented a very good inclusive uh, inclusive politics uh, and where uh, many communities who until then felt uh, that they were marginalized um, were brought uh, to fold. And of course, that inclusive politics, security sector reform, engaging the rebels, engaging the traditional elders and religious leaders I think is a key um, factors that helps us overturn the very uh, devastating security and political situation in the region. The, that uh, is not to say that uh, there hadn't been glitches, that it wasn't all smooth sailing, that you had some, some challenges at, at some point uh, or uh, attempts on uh, on you personally or uh, uh, some kind of, uh, I don't know, coup d'etat at some point that was uh, undertaken. Am I wrong in that? Or, uh, or was, was there some, some glitch? Uh, 
in, in a short time that you managed to contain? Well, uh, several anti-reform elements is, uh, were uh, trying to throw Spanish into our uh, reform road. And uh, as you say, a lot of attempts have been made to uh, stop the reform in the Somali region. We believe the main uh, sponsor of these activities were the TPLF and the remnants of the old regime, their, their uh, 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 puppets in the Somali region. So yes, we faced a lot of challenge, uh, especially in the first one year. Uh, and uh, the challenges presented themselves in uh, smear campaigns, in incitements of communities, clans against one another, in uh, attempts of assassinations, um, uh, uh, you know, turning uh, different uh, institutions, uh, political institutions against one another, the party, the parliament, the president office. So a number of things have been tried. Uh, but all failed uh, because the leadership, the regional leadership, not only myself, but the rest, were uh, aware of the challenges ahead and were committed to ensure that uh, the reform agenda succeeds. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the, the, the TPLF's toxic, divisive uh, politics along clan lines uh, that it uh, practiced for decades in the Somali region uh, was quite, quite a challenge, wasn't it? How, how were you able to transcend this uh, artificial clan politics or clan divides into uh, unifying the whole population behind you? What were uh, the political measures you took to, to make sure that uh, you were not sabotaged uh, along those lines? Yeah, um, as I earlier, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the main challenge was the divisions that the TPLF um, brought uh, among our people, or um, to to put it correctly, not brought but exasperated. Uh, we always had that just can fishers here and there, um, but that has been politicized and uh, rigidified by the TPLF, and therefore it was not easy to. Uh, bring all clans onto the same level. What I tried, we uh, devised uh, an inclusive narrative from the start that we are all Somalis, that we don't need sub-Somali identities uh, to dominate our politics. Uh, however, as I said earlier, um, ensuring that there is some sort of inclusivity in uh, power sharing in uh, economic op creating op economic op opportunity economically um, for the different zones and districts, ensuring some sort of equity in resource distribution, the government budget. I think those initial signs helped us uh, to a great degree to get the the the, the trust of the of the people. Uh, that does not mean there are no uh, divisions still, there are. Um, but um, I think the overwhelming majority of the Somali, the people of Somali region now understand that uh, they can democratically uh, express their differences in terms of opinions. And uh, that is a government that allows and listens to their grievance and tries to, to respond to it. But of course, mm -hmm. the uh, reactionary forces who have been with the TPLF for all this time are still around and have significant clout and resource. So it's uh, by no means, uh, we are not yet out of the woods in that regard. Challenges are here, uh, but uh, we are comfortable that at the, at the leadership le level, we have a very cohesive team now. I think the difference has been our ability to ensure that there are Somalis who have agreed uh, to work together without the, the, advi the, the advices and the supervision of, uh, uh, of, of outsiders. Uh, the, the, the things that the TPLF used to do. 
was to the build rule by video. proxy is, is not rule by proxy. So that uh, autonomy that we're enjoying now, uh, I think, has allowed us to take more responsibility and to ensure that uh, the those uh, labels that used to be put on us as Somalis, uh, that we are always clannish, that we are always divisive, uh, are not true. So the political leadership in the Somali region, uh, starting with the executive committee members of the ruling party, uh, have all agreed that uh, this is a time uh, that we debunk uh, the stories of Somalis as uh, extremely uh, sectarian beings who cannot uh, overcome their clan loyalties. So I think the major achievement in the last two years has been getting a very cohesive political leadership at the regional level. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, the, the neglected economic development of the region over the past decades, uh, uh, what have you been doing, for example, in terms of uh, road, highway, building of infrastructure, schools, uh, clinics, health uh, sectors, and uh, you know, rural development? Uh, two times is uh, two years is a short time, of course, but uh, uh, I I hear that uh, there has been impressive uh, development in that area. So, can you elaborate? Give us some figures. Uh, to complete the picture? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, there has been very commendable uh, development activities in uh, the sectors you mentioned. Uh, to start with, uh, we focused on education, increased the budget for education from somewhere around 100 million bur to nearly 1 billion uh, Ethiopian uh, bur. That showed serious commitment um, through our resource allocation. Uh, we are glad that we uh, constructed close to 80 uh, secondary schools, 80, of which about uh, 60 have already started uh, giving service. Well, uh, about 20 will complete in the next month. Uh, this is significant when you compare to the fact that um, to give a sort of comparison, in the last seven years, I think three to four secondary schools were built. In the region. So that gives you um, how much the progress has been made. Um, we have also been able to perform on the construction of primary schools as well. Over 500 schools were constructed in different districts. Uh, we have been able to, uh, cons to start the construction of about 11 uh, boarding schools. In the last 30 years, the region had three boarding schools. And in the last two years, we have added another 11, which will serve pastoral, pastoral communities because most of the school dropouts come from the fact that pastoral communities cannot uh, send their children to towns where they don't have relatives, especially the poor ones. So that actually will, uh, will be a game changer in terms of education, educating the, our pastoral communities. Uh, in terms of the health sector, um, 11 hospitals are under construction, of which uh, three are new, five are upgrading, and uh, three are uh, um, uh, expansion. Expansion upgrading means the from, for instance, primary primary hospital to uh, uh, main hospital, but uh, expansion is uh, expanding the services that's being provided by the hospital. So. Close to 11 uh, hospitals are in good, uh, are under construction. Uh, this will significantly enhance the health coverage uh, and the service uh, to the public. We have been able to start uh, also about 28 health, cl health clinics, or health centers in different uh, districts. Um, we have been able to distribute more than 135 ambulances to uh, districts where ma maternal death has been high because of the lack of roads and because of the lack of uh, um, delivery facilities nearby. So I think this is significant investment in health as well. We have been able to construct um, more than 
2,200 kilometers of uh, rural road networks. Uh, not all have uh, been completed, but uh, two, almost 2,200 uh, kilometers are uh, underway. To give you a comparison, in the last 27 years, the entire investment in, on road network in Somalia region has been about 1,400 kilometers. So that shows you how much, uh, how much progress has been made. Uh, the federal government also has been very generous to us in the last two years. And more than 1,200 asphalt roads, concrete asphalt roads, uh, are um, being implemented in the Somali region. Again, to give you a perspective of that, the entire road network, asphalt concrete road network in Somali region, was in the hundreds, close to 300, 400 kilometers. But only the last two years, over 1,200 kilometers very vital roads um, uh, are, uh, are being implemented. Uh, in terms of the water sector, we have spent more than 2.5 billion uh, per in water development of water resource, uh, mainly focusing on urban areas. When the biggest project is the one we are uh, currently implementing in Gode, the second largest town, Gode, Gode. Uh, close to 500 million CPM per, which will uh, be, provide uh, adequate water supply to over 100, uh, 150,000 people. So a lot has really been achieved on that regard. In terms of job creation, we have uh, created jobs both in the civil service, but also um, outside the civil service for over 100,000 youth, women and youth. So. Uh, commendable uh, uh, development activities are underway, but the development gap is so big that even all this investment I have talked about um, haven't yet uh, managed to take our people out of the dire situation they are in. The gap was so huge, uh, the, the base was so low that whatever investment I have told you now uh, does not mean uh, uh, significant change has come to the life of our, our people. But a very good beginning, I would say. A good start, an impressive start indeed. Uh, I mean, uh, massive uh, investment in vital uh, social programs, infrastructure is, uh, is very important. And the region also used to suffer from rampant corruption and uh, contraband of the uh, TPLF uh, you know, army generals and their proxies in the region. How have you been successful in stopping that uh, bleeding or the kleptocracy? Yeah, uh, well, the changes at the center also has been very helpful in that regard. Uh, the changes uh, by Dr. Abi at the center, of course, cut a big chunk of the, uh, cut out a big part of the problem the TPLF generalists and uh, the, the deep state. So in that regard, uh, I, we've been very uh, lucky. Um, but also the, the political culture that we inherited in the region was such that uh, embezzling public resources um, was taken as a normal thing by the, by the people. So tackling that has been one of the, the biggest challenges, especially in a situation whereby we were outsiders who did not have the necessary political clout and connections at the start to uh, uh, fight fight it. Uh, but we, we, we did fight corruption. We uh, strengthened the accountability mechanisms, the Auditor General, uh, the Parliament oversight, the media, all of this contribute to transparency. Once the media is able to talk about things that go wrong, once the communities uh, can give uh, feedback on how projects are going on or how public officials are serving them, uh, once the, uh, the Auditor General and other uh, financial institutions are free and are not politicized to uh, go and do their work, I think that itself enhances accountability. Having said that, uh, we still think uh, there is room for improvement, but uh, today nobody in Somali region is talking about um, 
payments made for projects that are not uh, done, uh, which has been the case just years back. Today, what we are talking about is about value for money, um, how much uh, uh, the cost of the projects uh, are, are, are uh, in line with what they should be. Um, contract administration issues uh, are tender processes conducted in the best way possible. Uh, these are the areas where we need to fine tune and, and, and improve on. Obviously, uh, it requires a lot of change in personnel, which we did, but it also requires a lot of change in mentality, which will come over time. But the accountability measure has been enhanced to an extent that uh, it has allowed us to uh, show clear uh, progress on infrastructure and uh, social service provision. Mm -hmm. uh, before I move to other topics from the region, uh, your population also over the past uh, decades had uh, suffered tremendously from, uh, you know, population fleeing in, you know, to, uh, to exile refugees in neighboring countries, maybe Europe. So in the past two years, how successful have you been in terms of uh, people returning, uh, coming back to invest in, in their uh, homeland? And uh, Because uh, I think the Somali region has a huge uh, diaspora population, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, massive displacement has, uh, has happened uh, in the TPLF era. Uh, most people fled to diaspora, but also to neighboring countries. Actually, the majority of the people went to Kenya and different parts of Somalia, Djibouti, and nearby Arab countries. The lucky ones went to the diaspora who had connections. So uh, there's a huge uh, uh, return of people from all these neighboring countries. Um, on average, uh, urban centers have now have 15% uh, more people, we can say, on average. Towns like Jijiga, like Dagabur, like Abridar, like Gori, uh, you would find that uh, the population has increased dramatically after um, the, the reforms. These were uh, people who were refugees in neighboring countries. Uh, so uh, they have come back with the skills, with the... Uh, a lot of uh, things to bring to the region, but also they have come back with a lot of issues. Because most of them are jobless and need support. And I think the next uh, uh, challenge will be also to ensure that they are integrated back to their communities. Uh, however, in terms of the diaspora, um, there's also significant improvement. A lot of people have come back and have started uh, investing in the service sector, mainly in the service sector, transport sector, uh, micro, um, industries like agro-processing, um, people have come back. However, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has kind of slowed down the return of the, of the, of the diaspora, but uh, there's huge change in that. And uh, we think um, once the pandemic is over, uh, more and more diasporas will come back, not only to invest here, but also to leave several uh, in several countries, Somalis are contacting us saying that they see a lot of opportunities in the Somali region and they want to come back and invest and live in the region. So we expect even more people coming back in the coming years. Very well. Now moving on to the larger picture, the bigger picture of uh, the Ethiopian uh, political scene. Of course, the past uh, month has been... Uh, a uh, very critical, challenging period for Ethiopia. Uh, the conflict that the TPLF instigated. How do you see the situation now? Uh, I mean, in the past month, there has been a lot of pressure for a uh, lot of dialogue and, uh, you know, uh, concerns for humanitarian uh, issues in Tigray. Has that now uh, 
been sufficiently addressed, uh, do you feel? Yeah. Well, uh, I think the concerns, international concerns for uh, the humanitarian, uh, about the humanitarian situation in Tigray come from two circles. I think uh, some are genuinely concerned about uh, the impact uh, the conflict will have on civilian populations. Um, those have been engaged by the government. Agreements have been signed. And uh, the Ethiopian government has promised unfettered access to people in need. Uh, but some of the outcry was, uh, po was political. It was coming from um, international uh, media and international uh, community members who, uh, at the start of the conflict, seemed to have taken a very partisan uh, uh, approach to the conflict uh, and who uh, by their deeds and statements seemed the spokespersons of the TPLF. So for those the concern continues because the concern uh, is, is not about the people, it's about uh, saving the TPLF junta. That's how we understand and uh, of course those will continue to make uh, statements um, about this, the, the, how, how bad the situation is. Uh, it's expected that uh, in a situation like this, there will be some collateral damage uh, to the civilian population. But the primary responsibility of protecting uh, the people of Tigray lies with the government of Ethiopia. So, and uh, I think the transitional uh, regional administration is, is, has, has put in place um, itself now to govern uh, and uh, things are improving, uh, aid conveys are going in and um, it's unfortunate that uh, we are in this situation but uh, the behavior of the TPLF obviously uh, was the main reason why we are here. Mm -hmm. But to, to come back to your question, yes, humanitarian concerns are being addressed by the government. Okay. Um... In terms of uh, the TPLF itself as a, as a political power, uh, the, the, the clique or the junta, uh, is the, the military operation to restore peace now largely over? Is it defeated or uh, give us a sense of what things are like on the ground? Yes, uh, the TPLF is defeated. They are removed from power. Um, but uh, the operation of uh, finally uh, bringing the, the junta leaders uh, before justice is not yet finalized. But for all purposes and, and intent, the TPL is no longer uh, a power in, in Ethiopian politics or in, region, in, in Tigray region for that matter. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been uh, a keen observer of uh, the TPLF's uh, divisive and toxic ideology for uh, a number of years. Uh, you've been writing way before uh, you came to assume leadership in the Somali region and the social media. I mean, I've been one of your followers there. Uh, what do you think, uh, why did the TPLF made such a blunder, why was it not able to accept the reform uh, when it came in 2018? What took it so long and what led to the final blunder it made in openly attacking the, the Northern Command space, uh, which currently led to its demise? What was it? What, couldn't they see the... the <laughs> the march of folly uh, along which they were traveling? Well, we can only speculate what was in their mind, but uh, of course, ignorance, uh, arrogance, complacency, you can name a lot of uh, factors that may have contributed to their downfall. It is really very difficult to understand why uh, they could not see the writing on the wall how they felt that they can be enemies of Eritrea, 
in the midst of Amhara, in the midst of Oromo, in the midst of Somalis, and survive. It's really, really strange how to, how to comprehend that. Uh, but uh, going back to TPLF's uh, uh, thinking, I think the fact that they have uh, started from a very humble beginning, um, they were also helped by a lot of geopolitical uh, factors to come to power. Uh, and uh, along the way, they have developed a psychology of uh, uh, belligerence, a psychology of uh, supremacy. I think that has blinded them to the storm that they were facing. That's the only way I can, I can feel. So having um, achieved what they never set out to achieve, uh, ruling a country of 120 million, becoming a power broker in the entire Horn of Africa, and uh, globally as well in some cases, uh, I think uh, made them feel invincible. And even after they were ousted from power at the center, they could still uh, not process what happened. They could still not see the forces that were turning against them. That's why uh, they did not make any attempt to solve any of the issues they had with Eritrea or with the neighboring Amhara region or with the, uh, with the Orom Oromia. Uh, and uh, I think they had ample opportunity to save themselves, given that the prime minister was very magnanimous, very magnanimous and generous at the start of the reform. And I'm aware of how much uh, he tried to uh, bring them on board. Uh, you yourself but, uh, alluded to the, the Prime Minister, Dr. Abi Ahmed's uh, magnanimity and, uh, you know, accommodationist uh, approach to, to bring them to, to the fold uh, that uh, seemed to many uh, a bit exacerbating. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, he tried everything to ensure that they are part of the new uh, coalition, the new party, Prosperity. Uh, I was uh, privy to a lot of discussions in that regard. He also tried uh, to uh, be very patient with them even after they refused to join the Prosperity Party and went to elections in the region. Uh, although they were committing some very grave constitutional crimes. Uh, I think uh, the Prime Minister did not uh, feel it was time to confront them. I felt he was thinking that he somehow uh, will find partners among them, some rational uh, guys among the leadership who will come up with a different approach. That didn't happen. And uh, what happened on October 4 uh, with the attack uh, of the was it October four or November four? Uh, November. November. I November. Sorry. November four. four yeah, I think. The attack on the Northern Command finally uh, brought matters to where we are today. So, Tipe Levi's arrogance and the ignorance, I think, mm. is to blame for uh, where they are today. It was as if in uh, that saying in the Greek mythology, those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad with hubris. <laughs> yeah. uh, seems to apply to, to TPL of hubris, as you said, arrogance of power and that sense of invincibility and not willing to accept the, 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 the reality of change on the ground uh, seem to have finally led to their... Um, blunder of, uh, of that attack. But uh, as the, the, the conflict raged on, starting from uh, November 5, many observers, uh, outside observers, uh, or so-called experts, seem to think that uh, the TPLF's force was uh, invincible, that it would drag, the conflict would drag into a protracted, long uh, affair. But the end seemed to quickly come in two, three weeks. Uh, did that surprise you? Or yeah, I think hubris is the right word. Um, couldn't have said it better uh, for their fall down. 
but in terms of the uh, ease with which they were brushed aside after the military operation, uh, yes, I was surprised, like many others. Um, I would, had no doubt that they will be defeated, but uh, I thought I, I genuinely felt that they will mount some uh, uh, resistance that is uh, bigger than what we have seen. So in that regard, uh, uh, the feeling of money that the TPLF were bullies, uh, not uh, brave fighters, I, th I think has come to, to materialize in that regard. But yeah, definitely surprised. But a good deal of uh, credit also goes to how uh, the Ethiopian National Defense Force and the political leadership um, planned for uh, for the for the law operation uh, for the operation. I think that that made the, the difference. Indeed, I mean uh, the the level of uh, resistance, brave fighting, regrouping quickly, and. Uh, they, it seems as if the entire population of Ethiopia also rallied behind uh, Dr. Abi and the leadership and the, the national defense forces, didn't it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, the TPLF didn't have many friends in, the, in Ethiopia anyway. So um, perhaps all ethnic groups um, were happy to see their uh, fall down. And uh, I think it was easy for the government to get the support of the public, uh, not only because of uh, what they have done on, on November 4, but also because of their uh, horrendous human rights track record when they were mm -hmm. uh, ruling Ethiopia. So they didn't have many friends. In that regard, now, the horrendous uh, human rights track record uh, they committed, uh, the atrocities, genocide, and uh, sorry, how do you think uh, has the inventory been made? For example, you in the Somali region have made some sort of attempt to inventory all those uh, crimes, but elsewhere, uh, have, uh, has that serious task been undertaken, or uh, do you think that uh, as the the top leadership of the TPLF are apprehended and brought to justice. Is uh, that an ongoing work uh, that needs to be seriously tackled? Yeah, I believe, as you may remember, um, the Prime Minister in the first uh, days of the reform was very much looking uh, for forgiveness and, uh, you know, kind of burying the past as a way of bringing the nation together. So uh, we can all debate about uh, whether that was right or wrong, but I think that has kind of uh, helped the TPLF in the sense that not much of its crimes has been unearthed. I think as we get into a situation whereby most of the junta leaders are brought to justice, uh, a lot of other uh, new uh, revelations will come uh, and there will be uh, uh, will be made public. But I am of the opinion that not much has been done in terms of documenting and uh, uh, showing to the Ethiopian public uh, the extent of human rights abuses that the TPLF was involved. Mm -hmm. uh, now, moving forward, post-TPLF uh, scenario, Yes, um, the TPLF has been militarily defeated, but uh, is the legacy of its politics, of divisive politics, uh, still there? What remains to be done in terms of uh, transcending that uh, toxic legacy? You have alluded, I think, to this in one of your uh, recent uh, articles in Facebook. Yeah, uh, post-TPLF, Ethiopia has uh, many challenges. Uh, the toxicity, the hatred and all have kind of uh, affected um, many people, uh, including politicians, political leaders and all. So I think uh, it's not uh, an impossible job, but uh, a lot of 
patience, a lot of uh, compromise, a lot of talking to each other is required uh, if we are to overcome the very divisive uh, um, politics of the TPLF. Uh, with TPLF, not all Ethiopia's problems are gone. Um, there still are a, a very polarized political situation in the country, the far left, the far right. Uh, when it comes to um, Ethiopian uh, state building um, an ethnic rights issue. There's a lot of divergent views on this. Uh, I think uh, keeping the right balance between these very polarized positions is the main challenge. And I think the Prosperity Party has taken the lead in terms of articulating how it wants to bridge uh, this, polarize, this polarization. Um, and a sort of uh, political vision is uh, now established by the Prime Minister to manage ethnic nationalisms, accept them as a reality, but also not to uh, treat them as fait accompli, but to transcend them uh, uh, and, and bring also a concurrent uh, civic nationalism uh, that unites the country. I think um, the success of that project will determine the future of Ethiopia. Yes, um, the question also uh, that uh, is debatable, it seems to me, is that of uh, the future of federalism. There, there are those within the Ethiopian political circles that see the federalism or the ethnic federalism, as they call it, as the source of all uh, the danger of divisiveness, uh, whereas uh, the others on the other side, the ethno-nationalists, see that as a guarantee for you know people's right to self-determination, uh, autonomy, and uh, you know uh, uh, as a safeguard against uh, hegemony from centrist uh, political forces. So how, how uh, w within the prosperity party, how, how do you see this, uh, these issues uh, that, uh, that could be sources of future conflict? Yes, um, I think uh, prosperity is centrist in its approach. It's centrist, it does not subscribe to the school of thought that uh, um, minimizes the rights and uh, uh, the, the, the rights of nationalities and ethnic groups uh, to a creation of TPLF. It does not subscribe to that school of thought. Uh, it admits that the way uh, those uh, ethnic uh, questions has been uh, manipulated by TPLF has added to the problem and has exasperated the divisions and has rigidified uh, societal divisions, uh, but it does not think uh, that's that's all the story. On the other hand, it also does not subscribe to the ethno-nationalist position that uh, extreme, going to the extreme, extreme nationali uh, nationalism and very insular political aspirations that only focus on the pain of particular ethnic groups is the way to go. So what it's trying to do is to uh, accept the reality that Ethiopia is a very diverse country, ethnically, culturally, historically, religiously. It's a very, diverg di very diverse country. So it uh, accepts that diversity and understand that it has to be managed uh, in a proper way. It ha uh, different uh, ethnic groups have different aspirations uh, about uh, how the Ethiopian policy should look like. So I think um, in that regard, it wants um, some of the gains made in the last 30 years in terms of recognition of the uh, rights of the language, uh, for the, the language of uh, ethnic groups, um, uh, enhanced particip political participation of, uh, of marginalized ethnic groups, mainly in the periphery, in the national politics. All of these are the gains that need to be built upon, not discarded. On the other hand, it also understands that the country cannot 
endlessly go into the dichotomy of these uh, ethnic groups' interests versus this, inter inter this uh, ethnic group's uh, interests. So in that regard, sort of uh, uh, civil, uh, civic uh, nationalism, civic nationalism in the sense that something that uh, transcend, transcends the ethnic divisions uh, has, to be, has to be worked on. And, and, and I think the, the prosperity project is articulated in this way. Uh, implementing it may not be as easy as articulating it. But I think uh, the solution to everything starts with the, with the idea. And the idea uh, is correct. In terms of implementing, it requires uh, uh, the right political elite, uh, the right uh, uh, political leadership uh, that can uh, manage this transition ensure that our differences are not a source of uh, uh, division, but our differences are a source of uh, pride, um, but also the fact that uh, we know with, with, the for, with the state formation of Ethiopia, uh, there has been severe uh, uh, differences among different groups, and acknowledging that and moving forward is a solution. So I think uh, the political program of the, of the Prosperity Party uh, centers on the fact that uh, there's a need to bridge these two polarized uh, political positions in the country, expressed by the far right uh, assimilationist kind of groups uh, and by the far left separatist kind of uh, groups. So the need for, uh, uh, you see the need for uh, a balance of uh, the mainstream bringing the extremes to, to a consensus uh, of the center is much needed in the political space in terms of uh, going forward as, as the country moves towards election next June of uh, 2021. Yeah, I think it's inevitable that we will have extremists on both sides. Even mature advanced democracies still have those groups. So the idea is not to go and eliminate them, but to ensure that the mainstream are much bigger than the far right and the far left. And in main, by mainstream, we mean uh, the moderates in, in both schools. So elements of both uh, can exist. Uh, what we don't want is extremes to dominate the center. So the center has to be um, con uh, controlled by and influenced by the moderates, by the moderates mm -hmm. who uh, are not categorical about the solution of the country, who accept that uh, the existence of other views and other ideas, and who want to compete democratically and share uh, their ideas in the political marketplace, rather than uh, going to eliminate uh, the, the, the opposing opposing views. So I think with the uh, elections, with building the democratic institutions in the country, uh, I believe uh, the mainstream can be strengthened to reflect uh, a very civil and uh, uh, moderate politics in the country. But you will always have the, fringe, the, 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 the extremists on the fringe. I think that we have to accept as a matter of political fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of uh, economic issues uh, or challenges facing the country, Ethiopia, uh, right now it has, uh, you know, the largest uh, GDP in the region uh, with the potential of becoming an economic powerhouse, but uh, the legacy of uh, the previous regimes, kleptocracy, uh, huge uh, foreign debts also remain, and the, the center-periphery uh, divide or marginalization that uh, Professor John Markekis talked about in his last book, uh, Ethiopia, The Last Two Frontiers, uh, is also there. So how, how is this gap being narrowed, this... Uh, periphery versus center uh, in terms of economic development and uh, the larger uh, economic prospects for the country. How do you see that? 
Uh, well, it's uh, true that uh, the way the economy was managed um, left a lot of uh, uh, problems for the for the new uh, government. Um, it's also true that uh, commendable economic growth has been registered uh, in the last couple of years uh, in Ethiopia, uh, but most of it through external loans and debts and all. So uh, in that sense, um, the country has to reorient its economic policy uh, to rely more on uh, enhancing productivity and productive sectors. Uh, I am very surprised that the export sector, for instance, in Ethiopia now is showing a, a huge uh, increase in the last uh, two years, even amid the COVID-19 pandemic, um, with new uh, items coming into the, to take the, the, the big share in, 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 what, in what we export. Uh, for instance, gold has now become one of the four main export items for the country. So the economy is, is, is in good shape. Uh, of course, it's affected by the global pandemic. It's also affected by the uh, uh, by the sabotages of the TPLF and anti-reform elements in different parts of the country. Uh, but uh, the economy is the, is, uh, the key if we are going to uh, succeed as a country. And I think the government has uh, developed uh, the right tools, um, the right uh, approach so far. Uh, in terms of the center periphery relations, um, a lot uh, is left uh, to be uh, to, 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 to overcome what Merkakis has, has articulated in his, in his book. Um, yes, there's a development gap between the center and the periphery still. There's also a development gap uh, uh, between those you think are the center uh, themselves, the regions. It's acknowledged that uh, uh, the four EPRDF regions, for instance, uh, when EPRDF was in power, have relative uh, better uh, figures in uh, economic performance and development. Uh, but also if you treat uh, Tigray as a periphery in this, in, in the geographical sense, uh, then you will see that perhaps that development gap might not apply for uh, Tigray and the rest of the country if you take what happened in the last 30 years. So uh, if we take uh, Somalis and Benishangul, and Gambela, and Afar, and these other uh, the lowland regions, peripheries, so to the speak, lowland maybe. peripheries that used to be called um, developing regions um, in the uh, language of the EPRF, I think the, the, the center periphery um, gap in development in political participation is still uh, prominent. Uh, but a lot has been done to uh, address that in the last two years. I earlier mentioned the fact that the federal government is now investing hugely on road networks in Somali region. I think that's the same for other regions as well. Uh, in terms of enhancing our political share and participation at the center, a lot has changed, uh, including uh, the fact that we are now sitting on the table with the, in, in, the, in, the, in the new prosperity party uh, structure. Uh, we have good representation. Um, uh, we, uh, from the Somali perspective, feel like uh, a lot of progress has been made in the last two years. Um, but uh, if you look at the bureaucracy at the national level, uh, our share, our participation is still very low. The participation of the lowland areas is also very low. So I think that gap is still there. But there's readiness uh, to acknowledge and to do something about it uh, by the new reform team at the center. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Moving to still a bigger picture of uh, our region, the Horn of Africa, where we here on Horn of Africa TV are very much uh, 
concerned, uh, this new post-DPLF era that uh, Ethiopia is entering, do you feel it will enhance the uh, larger uh, peace, security, stability of the Greater Horn of Africa region, and also the, the desired economic integration? Uh, for example, you in the Somali region think can play the role of a bridge where you connect uh, your you border Kenya, Somalia, and also Djibouti. So your, your geographic location vis-a-vis uh, -vis this great uh, Horn of Africa integration, how do you feel that works uh, for you? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the right ideas are uh, there in terms of regional integration. Um, Prime Minister has done very well in building good partnership with the, with the countries in the in Horn of Africa. Uh, the rapprochement between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea is a very good one. Uh, Ethiopia also has a very good relationship with uh, Sudan, with Somalia, with Djibouti, um, with Kenya, Uganda, and, and uh, very much uh, in a new spirit of uh, uh, treating each other as equal partners, as opposed to the, the real sense of cooperation. See, real that, sense that of that never cooperation existed under the TPLF. That never, yes, that never existed in the very intrusive and divisive uh, TPLF era, where uh, um, the TPLF was using the IGAD uh, mechanism uh, to undermine genuine uh, partnership. Uh, in, in this area. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, the people are very optimistic. Uh, I can speak for Somalis uh, because I have uh, been engaging most of the Somali political leaders in the Horn of Africa. And uh, there is a sense of euphoria and sense of optimism that hasn't been there before, that uh, the new regional integration of the Horn of Africa can make Somalis the primary beneficiaries because of the way they are located geographically and because they um, uh, live in many of these countries that want to uh, economically integrate. Uh, I know uh, the same might be the feeling in, uh, in Eritrea and other countries that have been cut out uh, from the rest of uh, the Horn of Africa in the past. So um, the prospect is very good. Uh, the idea is, is, is very good, and uh, I think the pain that the region has gone through in the last 30 years, the division, the, the, the bullying, the, uh, you know, connivance with the external actors to undermine uh, political leaders in, uh, who do not toe the line, I think uh, uh, that's over, and a new spirit of cooperation, new spirit of Brotherhood is emerging. Of course, uh, this narrative is not going to be agreed uh, or accepted by, by the junta, the TPLF who lost power, because uh, all of the things we are talking about now are things that they try to prevent when they were in power. So now, having lost out, uh, I think uh, it's a different era for them. It's an era of uh, promise, era of uh, uh, optimism for us. And it's an era of pain, an era of, uh, uh, you know, uh, doom for, uh, for TPLF. Mm -hmm. And your region specifically, um, do, you, do you envision, for example, Jigjiga or the, as a hub uh, connecting uh, various parts of the Horn of Africa? dynamic? Definitely. We are working toward that. We actually have been making a lot of engagements to ensure that Jijiga becomes the center as far as the eastern part of the Horn of Africa is concerned, mainly as a, as a, as a hub for, for Somalis uh, and also for nearby Ethiopian regions, Harage, Eastern Harage, Western Harage, all 
we can find uh, uh, very strong linkages um, with other regions as well. Mm -hmm. In in my previous uh, conversation with the uh, Kenyan Somali politician Farah Muallam, uh, we talked about uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of, of Somalis that uh, can play the role of uh, a glue to, to or a driving force behind this uh, idea of economic integration, regional economic integration of the Horn of Africa. Uh, do you agree with this uh, assessment or you have a different yeah. perspective? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that is uh, now acknowledged by most um, of East Africans that Somalis are very entrepreneurial and that they are very creative in finding opportunities and business opportunities. And yes, I agree. Uh, the regional integration offers a very good chance for Somalis to thrive um, in business. And uh, what are you doing in your uh, Somali regional state in terms of uh, encouraging investment, uh, nurturing uh, a business friendly atmosphere for uh, foreign and domestic investors to, to attract uh, you know economic uh, development to your region yeah uh, as you know the last two years has been years of transition so um, a lot of business people uh, I, seems to be feeling okay let's wait how things go even when the signs are very positive I think uh, many of them would like to see um, the transition, uh, you know, materialize. Uh, because until the 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 law uh, enforcement operation against people was started, uh, a lot of things were happening in different parts of the country, which uh, could sow some doubt on 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 on, the, on business and investment, uh, and uh, the toxic. Propaganda by the TPL eleven remnants of the old regime were also that somehow Ethiopia is falling apart. Uh, the system is not stabilizing. So I think that kind of might uh, have been a factor in not seeing huge influx of capital and, and, and from interna from international and domestic investors. But uh, people are coming, particularly investing in agriculture, in uh, service sector, and all. We have organized two major, uh, uh, I think, uh, not major, but two, yeah, good um, trade fairs, exhibitions to showcase what the region offers, and the federal government also um, has uh, has been engaging a lot of international investors, particularly in the areas of irrigation, uh, so that they can come and invest in Somalia region. So. A good deal of uh, things are happening, and we are encouraging uh, investors to come and invest in by giving them uh, the support they need in terms of land, in terms of the business-friendly environment, uh, the stability and security in the region itself is a big uh, incentive for people to come and invest. So a lot has been done, uh, and there's a good progress in, in investment. I think uh, by our estimate, close to one to 1.5 billion new investment uh, has been registered in the last one year. The last one year. 1.5 billion dollars or per? Per, Ethiopian per. Oh, I see. Uh, in, your, uh, in your region, I uh, mean the, the Somali region alone. In the Somali region, yeah. Cap that amount of capital has been registered by, some, uh, by, by domestic investors mainly. Mm -hmm. Uh, this may seem unrelated somehow, but since you lived and worked in Kenya, uh, you might have had a chance to observe uh, what is happening in Rwanda, the Rwanda model. What do you think of it? I'm, I'm just curious uh, because that is touted often as uh, the model of a business-friendly, futuristic uh, way to go. Uh, I'm wondering if you've had a chance to observe uh, Rwanda at close range and uh, what do you think of it? 
Uh, I haven't uh, really managed to observe uh, the Rwanda phenomena beyond what I hear on the media. Um, yeah, I I hear a lot of good things in how they transformed a devastated country. Um, not sure if uh, what worked in a given country can entirely ap be applied into another country because the uh, um, circumstances and uh, realities are very different. Uh, but I believe uh, Rwanda can offer uh, some starting experience or model for countries like us. Uh, now again, I'm saying this um, just because I don't really have a lot of information on how they have transformed the economy uh, of the country. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that uh, they pushed uh, really aggressively was, uh, you know, the high tech uh, industry, uh, you know, invest a lot in the IT sector. Uh, so in that regard, uh, how, how is the, you know, IT connectivity, internet, telecom in your region? Uh, Uh, well, still uh, uh, very challenging, but a lot of uh, um, progress has been made, I think, uh, particularly in electricity, uh, provision of 24-hour electricity to major urban areas. There has been some progress. Um, internet um, reach has increased. Uh, and... Uh, Things uh, are mobile slowly telephony, changing. Access, Telephones, access mobile. networks uh, has improved. But uh, again, as uh, you understand, the Prime Minister uh, is very much keen on innovation and technology. And to that extent, uh, the country, uh, technology and innovation is seen as a, a component of our development uh, strategy. And we're trying to to improve uh, a lot of things, um, but nothing um, out of uh, the normal things that I can now tell you beyond the fact that electricity, internet, and things have been expanded um, to some extent. However, still uh, very poor by global standards. Mm. Plus, uh, the Somali region is also vast. I mean, it, it, it is the second largest state, isn't it, in Ethiopia, regional state? Yeah, debatable. First or uh, second, in terms of <laughs> geographical size, yeah. Land, land mass size, I'm Land mass, about. yeah, yeah, uh, land mass. Uh, so, so do you see that as a challenge uh, connecting this vast uh, territory? Yes. Other, yeah. Yes, that's the major challenge, yes. That's a major, major challenge. When you also add the fact that uh, a large part of the region is sparsely populated uh, from investment and development rationale. Uh, yeah, it makes, it makes it very tricky. It's a big challenge. Yeah. Well, we're almost coming to the end of our show, but I have been meaning to ask this question. I don't know how to phrase it. Um, the young Mustafa Umar in the 1990s was more focused on economics, uh, non-political, uh, maybe, maybe that's my perception, but you, it seems to me that uh, politics was forced upon you by circumstances. Now that you are an active player in the politics of the Somali regional state and Ethiopia at large, uh what is your assessment uh, it seems politics is agreeing with you or am i reading too much into it G give us a sense uh, of uh, you know your uh, future plans and do you plan to stay uh, in, in politics for a while or do you plan to take an early retirement <laughs> or if you're not comfortable with this question you may just pass <laughs> His no. general comment. Uh, no, I think your observation is uh, correct. 
um, many of my friends uh, feel I have missed my calling and say that uh, politics has, has never been my calling. Um, given that I was uh, very much interested in literature, uh, uh, art, and, yeah, and the social, so, social side of life. I believe uh, I've, I've made uh, a comment along that line in one of your Facebook posts that uh, you have a, a good knack for uh, writing. Uh, yeah, I don't actually, know if you remember. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was uh, very much into those uh, fields before, as you rightly say, the circumstances has, uh, has forced me to join politics, first as an activist and later as a uh, political, uh, as, a, as a politician. I believe uh, the sad experiences uh, that my family uh, went through uh, in the TPLF era with the uh, family tragedies uh, might have gradually gravitated me toward this uh, uh, writing about politics, writing about justice, uh, writing about human rights. And uh, eventually that kind of coalesced into a position where I asked what can I do uh, more than writing? You know, what, what can I do more than writing? Which, uh, of course, obviously is perhaps I can uh, focus on uh, organizing as well, uh, politically. Um, but uh, very many of my friends know that my personal and behavioral disposition is much into those uh, literature and arts and things like that. However, uh, I don't think uh, that necessarily um, stops one from uh, serving in politics. Uh, as as has been uh, demonstrated uh, in the last two years, in terms of the future, yes, very much. I I was very much an accidental politician um, who came to to this position primarily to uh, implement some ideas that I thought were very useful. Um, but again, I honestly can't say much about the future. Um, many things can change along the way. Um, I'm not the kind of uh, person who really feels that um, I have, should have a particular uh, way to life. Uh, I think today I'm serving my people as a, as a politician. Tomorrow I may serve as an academician. Uh, or even as a humanitarian, or as a human rights activist, or in a different capacity. Um, I believe uh, I'm very content and happy with what we have achieved, what I personally achieved so far, in terms of first highlighting the pain of uh, Somali people in Ethiopia. And that alone was a, a good enough moral reward uh, for, for me. But uh, seeing the change I have seen now uh, with the f demise of the TPLF and all uh, has also made me extremely content. And uh, I think my life uh, from now on is a bonus. I'm okay with anything. I'm okay with anything. I never thought I would see uh, justice for all those uh, people who have been uh, dehumanized by the TPLF. And in many ways, I think I... Uh, the TPLF experience has made me a bitter person who focuses on, on the past pain. I hope uh, with the end of uh, that era of TPLF, I will now uh, regain my old self uh, of uh, cheerfulness and uh, happiness. That's what I hope uh, life will offer me. Next. Well, I can, as a witness, say that... Uh despite the the uh, tragedies and uh, many hurdles uh, you have not been bitter at all uh, in fact i'm often quite impressed with your sense of optimism of the will and uh thank you very much for the time you have given us from your busy schedule we hope uh, to continue the discussion uh, perhaps next year as uh, election season approaches 
but uh, I, I want to give you final words. Uh, if there are any messages you want to pass along to our viewers. No, uh, just to thank you, Elias, for uh, this opportunity. I also uh, have been uh, following you for a number of years now. We have been uh, partners in highlighting the, the TPLF um, uh, atrocities and uh, maladministration. I'm very glad that uh, we have met in this platform today, uh, looking at the post-TPLF era. Um, I am very pleased to have been interviewed by you. And I would like to thank our viewers as well uh, for taking time to watch our interview. That was President Mustafa Mohammed Umar of the Somali regional state of Ethiopia. And this wraps up our conversation for today. Thank you for listening. Please do subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Elias Amare. Salam. <laughs>